Um, so I want to uh, have a warm welcome to Richard H. Stevens. Uh, Richard began writing uh, around 1974, a bored child looking for something to do. A trip to a local bookstore saw the proprietor introduce him to the works of Terry Brooks and Stephen R. Donaldson, and his writing life was forever changed. Richard worked in a warehouse for 22 years before going back to school. Graduating with honors, he joined the local police service. In 2017, Richard resigned from police service to pursue writing full-time. With the support of his family, he has finally realized his boyhood dream. So welcome, Richard. And you're still not unmuted, so one second here. And you're not actually showing on screen. Good job, David. Well, you can talk while I figure out what's going on here. Can they hear me? Yes, they can hear you. They just well, can't see you at the moment. Awesome. <laughs> Maybe that's better. I've got a face for radio anyway, so <laughs> they were better off that way. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm a fantasy author. Uh, I've been writing since I was nine. I finally published my first book when I was 52, and I published the real book that I worked on for 35 years uh, when I was 53. So the first two books I published were just novellas. Yeah, I just wanted to learn so. Amazon. The first two books I published were just novellas. I just wanted to learn Amazon on there now. And I think we're on there now. Yes, you're on now, but now I've got a echo for some reason. I've only got the one tab open, so I'm not sure where it's coming from. Do you want me to put headphones on? No, I think it's on my end. Uh, keep talking. My first book because I had two careers and five children over those 35 years and of course uh, those things come first and being just a little Canadian author uh, unknown when I started writing back in the early 80s you, know, you either got published by the big five or you really didn't get published at all and so <laughs> it was more of a, just a hobby and uh, something I used to read to my kids and uh, I just enjoyed doing it but uh, with the advent of Amazon and uh, you know the internet and everything else uh, and Kindle and being able to publish ebooks, and you don't need to have a big name publisher now. I, I figure, oh, maybe I can do this. So I actually pitched an agent in Nashville in 2017, and it, it, I don't want to get into the long story about how it didn't go well, but uh, it, was just a, it was just a long process. There was ups and downs, and you think, okay, they want it. No, then they won't respond to you. And I didn't have a good uh, experience with the agent, so. Uh, I finally decided, you know, I got to do this myself. So I went out and got myself a professional cover designer and I, he's in Italy and I went out and got myself a, pub, a professional editor and she's in Glasgow. I am in Canada. So the internet's a wonderful thing. And uh, in 2018, uh, Soulforge was born. Nice. Now what, what makes Soulforge its own place? What, what makes it unique and different? Uh, Soulforge is its own universe, so uh, it's like epic or high fantasy. It has nothing to do with Earth. Uh, in 1982, I, well, actually, probably 1980, I, like I say, when you read the intro, I read Terry Brooks, and I fell in love with the sort of snarl. That was the first fantasy book I ever read, and it was just so magical. It'll still, it'll, to the day I die, it'll always be my favorite book, just because it's it's like watching Star if you're old enough, watching Star Wars A New Hope in 77. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how good the graphics are nowadays and how much better the story might be, that movie, A New Hope, will always be my favorite Star Wars movie because it's the first one I saw. Yeah, like, that's fair. You know, and the same with Terry Brooks' story of will always be my favorite book. But in uh, 1982, uh, I was 17, and uh, I was expecting my first child. And so I had to leave school and join the workforce, and we weren't living together as that mo at that time because he wasn't born yet. And I had my headphones on, and I was listening to late night radio in Canada, Q107. It's a station in Toronto, Canada. And the song Runs of the Hills from Iron Maiden came on. And <laughs> I had no idea why, but just listening to that, all of a sudden, it just put the Soul Forge saga in my head. I wasn't thinking about writing fantasy. I, I wrote other stuff. Mm -hmm. Never thought about writing fantasy, even though I loved reading fantasy. And it just put the story in my head. I knew how it was going to start. I knew how it was going to end. It was going to be a trilogy. I just didn't know what was going to happen in the 1,200 pages in between. So that's kind of bizarre because uh, Run to the Hills is not a fantasy song. It's right. kind of <laughs> American uh, 
Aboriginal, so. Well, just a simple thing of finding what what goes on in twelve hundred pages. That's that's easy, right? You know, as, as a panther, it's uh, it's great because uh, I just uh, open the front door, I kick my main character out, and he sees the world, and I view the world through his eyes. And as he walks through his busted picket fence gate the, in his front yard, and uh, we go through the woods, that's the extent of my world at that point. And uh, he turned right and he went north. And when we came out of the woods, there was a big grassland. And in the distance, there was a big mountain range. And that was my world. And but I got the experience like I was watching a movie. So as I'm writing my book, I had no idea what was going to come next. Uh, my characters decided what was going to happen. So I knew where I had to get to. I just didn't know how I was going to get there. Yeah, that's fair. Well, half of the fun of writing is figuring that out, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So what? What persuaded you or pushed you, inspired you to go from writing the stories to actually publishing them? Well, like I say, when, uh, with Amazon and everything else, uh, and I realized that, hey, I can do this myself, all of a sudden uh, there was a way to publish my books. But uh, it, it took me 35 years to get to the point where it was even done. Uh, like I say, I had five kids and two careers, and uh, my last career uh, left me so stressed out for the last 12 years of that career that uh, I had no ambition to write. I didn't want to write. I just had to think about trying to get through the next day. Mm. And so it was kind of put on the shelf. And then uh, in 2017, early 2017, my wife realized that the stress of that job was probably going to end up uh, prematurely ending my life. So we decided that I need to get out of there. And uh, with her financial support, she runs her own business. Uh, I left my job and uh, I started writing full time and that opened the doors to where I went and pitched the agent and then found the editor and uh, the cover artist. And then I started cutting my teeth at the end of 2017 on Amazon with my two novellas that I didn't care if anyone read. I just wanted to learn all the ropes, the mistakes and stuff on Amazon. So in 2018, when Soul Forge actually was ready to go, uh, I knew what I was doing. Excellent. So uh, this question comes from Sally Ocelot, who's uh, one of our frequent visitors here. She was asking, if you had to choose which book series that you've released, would you most prefer to represent you as an author? Um, my best selling series is uh, my Legends of the Lurker series. Uh, it's won a few awards. It's uh, my wife doesn't like fantasy and she, she won't read it. And, uh, but she's one of my proofreaders. So she's generally the, the poor person who has to read the first draft and as she's also the one that reads it at the end after it comes back from the editor and uh when she was reading Rika's flight she actually enjoyed the story she actually got she got involved in the character so normally she just reads along the line mm -hmm. doesn't even i guess i'll ask her what did you think of that scene she, i have no idea because she doesn't actually take in the scene she's just <laughs> reading it line for line trying to get rid of my you know those pesky typos and the, the punctuation that i might think that maybe it should be a comma here but she doesn't think it should be a comma there and you know, I'll decide at the end whether it's, this should be or not. But uh, she fell in love with that story, Rika's Flight. So that's probably my the series I'd recommend to most people. I, people ask me what's my favorite, like what's my best book, and I think uh, it's the book on my computer right now. I think that with every book, I get a little bit better. And so as authors, we should progress. Like when you work with your editor, the editor knows what they're doing, and they they tighten your story. And it just starts getting ingrained in your memory. And when you write, you suddenly start doing what the other was editing the book or two before, mm -hmm. and it almost becomes second nature. So I think my books get a bit tighter, uh, a bit more well-written as I go along. So Soul Forge will always be my book baby. It's the one that sat with me for 35 years. And I don't mean to say it's a bad book, but it's probably my poor, poorest written book. Mm. Well, luckily you have a whole, uh... Uh, guide on your website to tell you what order to read things in once once you get into the timeline, right? But, no, absolutely. Uh, if you on, um, my, I, so if you, anyone's familiar with Terry Brooks, uh, he writes his basically in trilogies, and every trilogy stands on its own. So you right. can pick up any trilogy in the Terry Brooks universe and the sort of the Shinari universe anyway. And uh, you, you don't have to read anything before or after. He might make references to certain characters that are maybe gone, like the Druid Alanon, but. It, the story doesn't hinge on that person. And if you don't know him, you just start okay, well, spouting something about history and you move on. But mine are the same way. So the Soul Forge saga, is, which is the first series I released, is actually the last series in my universe. I'd never 
envisioned at the time for 35 years I was going to write anything else. Hmm. I didn't think I'd ever write those three books. I didn't think I'd ever finish them. And then uh, halfway through Into the Madness, which is the third book in the Soul Forge universe, or in Soul Forge saga, uh, one of the main characters who, in my mind, for 35 years, was integral to the ending of the story, did something so bizarre that they are no longer going to be involved in the end of that story. And so my ending was gone. So for 35 years, I knew the ending. And in the 35th year, I didn't have an ending. So uh, I remember thinking to myself in 1982, uh, when I was listening to Run to the Hills, I envisioned the story. I thought to myself, I'm not going to write about dragons. I'm not going to write about elves. I'm not going to write about dwarfs. Everyone does that. I don't want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the dragon came into my story 35 years later. And it just opened up my whole universe. Mm -hmm. And now that's all I write about is dragons and elves and dwarfs. So <laughs> I am now that guy. So uh, people say write to market. I didn't intentionally write to market with the dragons. Uh, the dragon just happened to jump into my book because I needed an ending and it seemed that that fit. And But because of him coming into the end of the book and into the madness, uh, it just opened up everything. So now I've got like 25 books in my head. I just have to write them. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up uh, or that you mentioned uh, Terry Brooks. I was actually re rereading uh, the Magic Kingdom for Sale Sold series to yes. my kids um, over the winter. So it's just funny because I, re I read that as a kid. I never actually got into the Sword of Shannara series um, for no other reason than I had other books to read. I, I had plenty of books to read, obviously. And, uh, right. And I just never he, he did a good job. He actually them. went back in time. And he actually started it on Earth. And I guess you could say that the Shinar world is our Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost ap apocalyptic. Uh, but when you're first reading Sword of Shinar, you have no idea. Right. It's the Four Lands. But uh, he's gone back in time uh, and wrote how they were actually on Earth, like the Earth that we know. In, and it's in the U.S. It's in the Western United States, in Seattle and all that. And uh, so he uses landmarks and stuff like that. And it's a very good series. So uh, I, when it's funny, the Kingdoms uh, for Sale sold the first book in the the series you were mentioning when i saw the cover i'm thinking that looks corny i'm not going to read it and it, i never read it for years i only i read that maybe 10 years ago and just figured oh, i love terry brooks and i have no more terry books books to read because i caught up and uh, i'll read that one and actually i liked it it was actually good it was a lot different than the sort of snarrow but that's what probably made it uh, fun to read refreshing because it was different uh, so we actually have a question from the kids are asleep. Uh, uh, are there any fantasy tropes you love or avoid, and has that changed over time, like the dragons and elves? I don't think I avoid any tropes. Uh, I, with my new series, The Hype of Guardians, uh, because the dragons are prevalent, I wanted to write a different uh, trope in there. I actually did an interview with uh, some station in uh, California, and they actually read my book. Uh, Keeper of the Jewel, and it, so they knew it very well, and they loved the way I turned the goblin trope on its head. So if anyone is a Dungeons and Dragons player, you know that goblins are these pesky little characters that you level up on uh, as a low-level character because you know they're not very fearsome in that. They're, they 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 attack in droves, but they're they're just these little things that you can get uh, small experience points on them, and you level your character up. But uh, so I figure I'm, I want to write about a goblin, and uh, so I introduced a goblin in the High Cliff Guardian's uh, Keeper of the Jewel. And he is not someone that you will level up on. He is someone to level up on you. Uh, he's uh, he's actually uh, more superior than the highbrow elves, and the elves very, resent him very much because of it. And so they love the way I turned the goblin trope on his head. So this goblin is a very powerful goblin, even though he's just this little thing. So that's uh, one trope that I've uh, turned on his head, I guess. But uh, I, I don't intentionally look after writing uh, tropes and stuff like that. Uh, the dragons are in there now, and dwarfs. I love writing dwarfs just because they're fun. And uh, I've got half giants. I don't really have giant giants. Like I love Ari Salvatore. He's got great big giants in his books in the Forgotten Realms, but mm -hmm. I have half giants. I've never actually introduced where the half giants come from because obviously mm -hmm. they're a mixed breed. So I guess at some point I'm going to have to introduce a real giant, but I haven't got there yet. Oh, that's fair. Uh, kind of a related question, also from the kids who are asleep. Uh, do you worry about themes as you write or edit, or do you just leave, or do you leave that to readers to discover? And if you do it intentionally, what are some so common themes across your stories? Do I worry about themes? 
themes. Oh, themes. Yeah. I uh, know. I, I I tell people this all the time. I, uh, fantasy is uh, like any book that you write. It, it boils down to the relationship between two characters, or you know, man against or woman against uh, mother nature. It, it's always there's an adversarial uh, thing there, and it doesn't mean that one person is right. So your antagonist doesn't mean that he's a bad guy. He could be a good guy. He just sees things differently than your protagonist. But uh, as far as themes go, uh, I think all stories, it could be cozy mystery, it could be erotica, maybe not so much erotica, but it could be, uh, <laughs> it, it could be cozy mystery, it could be thriller, it could be uh, science fiction, it could be fantasy, but it, it all boils down to the relationship between basically two characters. And, and you know, you might have a couple more main characters, but it, it's all about how they're butting heads and how they try to resolve their issues or overcome the conflict that they have so i don't think fantasy really is much different than a cozy mystery or a, or a thriller it's uh, just done in a different kind of landscape and the cool thing about fantasy is you can put dwarves and elves and dragons in there which is something that i've learned to appreciate well sally ocelot has a follow-up question to that and and for her the most important question is do you have any pirates pirates i do have pirates I don't write, uh, like, they're not the main theme in my books. Uh, there are pirates that appear in book two in the Legends of the Lurker, but you don't really get to talk to those pirates per se. They're actually attacking the ship that uh, the protagonist is on. And uh, so there's a bit of a conflict with them there. So I haven't written a lot about pirates yet. Uh, there are pirates in my books. Uh, they're just kind of on the fringes. So. Uh, that's uh, something that I will probably put into one of my stories going forward, but uh, I don't have any plans to do that yet. All right, that's fair. Uh, so Green Bean Gangsta has a, has a question kind of related to how you got started. Um, yeah, so she asks, how did leaving your stressful job affect your creative energy? Was it scary even though you knew the stress wasn't good for you? And she signs it, someone in a stressful job. <laughs> Uh, it was the best thing that I that I've done for sure. Uh, I, I, I predetermined uh, or predestined to have heart issues. My it runs in my family. Uh, my eating habits are not great, so I don't help myself that way. So you know, I'm on medication for stuff like that. And then the stress of the job that I did uh, uh, was not good for me, and I couldn't think about writing. I couldn't think about anything else except uh, uh, what I'd probably be facing the next day. So. Uh, leaving that job was the best thing that ever happened to me for sure because it allowed me to follow my dreams and I remember uh, so that job I used to work at the police service and uh, I remember sitting in front of a house and this is the epiphany that day that uh, so I go through my paperwork see who I'm going to be talking to because you don't know who's on the other side of the door and I realized okay it's a 71 year old female or 70 year old female and I'm thinking to myself you know it should be decent and you shouldn't have any problems with her and, and I thought you know that's 19 more years for me. I'm going to be that age. It's just <laughs> seeing that her her uh, date of birth on that piece of paper, and I did the math. And, wow, 19 years. What am I going to be doing in 19 years? I'm going to be 70 years old, and I'm going to look back on life and think, you know, I've let it go by. So uh, my dream has always been to be a writer. And uh, I figured, well, that day is when I went home to talk to my wife about this and uh, the two of us decided that uh, we got to do it now because uh, the way I look at it is you know, life isn't a dress rehearsal. We don't get to go through life and figure out what we should have done and then come back and do it. Like, you don't get to come back and do it again. So at some point, obviously you need to have the financial means and we did at that point because we both had very good jobs at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, at some point you just have to follow your dreams and get to it sooner than later. I wish I would have done it a bit sooner, but you know, I was uh, 51 when I did, and it's never too late. So, uh, again, it's not a dress rehearsal. You can't come back and do it again. So if you've got a dream, go for it. Yeah. Well, that's hopefully what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I will never be Terry Brooks. You know, I'll never be famous like he is. Uh, of course, we all, as authors, I want people to read my books first and foremost. And I want them to, you know, hopefully that half the people who read my books enjoy them. I understand that not every author is for every reader, and I'm okay with that. But if I can satisfy half the people that buy my books, then I think I'm doing a good job. 
And you know, obviously, I would love to make a lot of money doing this and you know, sit in Bora Bora and write in the sand. But uh, realistically, there are just so many authors out there. And, uh, uh, you know, that probably won't happen for me uh, unless I get an HBO deal. But uh, <laughs> you know, that's a pipe dream. So I, I, I've already fulfilled my dream. I've, I've published a book and now I'm working on book 15. So everything's gravy from this point on. Yeah, you get a few out there. And, and plus, writing in the sand in Bora Bora, that doesn't transport well to books. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Well, I've got a picture in, uh, in Dragon Sect where uh, the, the main character, the, she's the princess of the elves at that point, but uh, she's on the beach and she's facing a wyvern. And it's got the sands. They look just like Bora Bora, so maybe we could work that in there. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I wanted to ask you about what your routine is like. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, I have my day job and I work in my writing when I can and and I know you've expressed some horror about writing live on stream like I do uh, yeah. <laughs> what what is your writing routine like how do you how do you find the time or how do you make the time work so before I got this part-time job the part-time job works great because I generally work three to five hours a day and then I can come home and work in the afternoon but before that I used to get up in the morning and I would handle social media and that's a rabbit hole that you get stuck in and you have to try and get yourself out of there. Uh, and then at, at some point I will finish with the social media and I will uh, edit. So I'm one of those people that I have to edit all the time right away. I do not put my book on a shelf and wait for three months. I'm editing it constantly. And I like it, I like editing. I enjoy doing it because I, I can see the value in doing it. And uh, you know yourself that you could edit your book a thousand times and you change it a thousand times. And you probably bring it right back full circle to almost where you started. But uh, so I will edit what I wrote yesterday. So I'm not a prolific writer, so I don't write uh, 10,000 words a day or more. I, a good day for me before COVID was about 2,500 to 3,000 words. And uh, so whatever I wrote yesterday, if it was 2,500 words, I will edit that today. And as soon as I'm done editing that, that puts me right where I need to be to start writing the next scene because now my mind is right where I am. So I will start writing in the afternoon. And in the afternoon, I'll write. Like since uh, post COVID, I don't know why, but uh, my writing count's gone down. I think our mind is uh, got too many things in it, and it's just it's hard to concentrate sometimes on uh, what you want to do. But I'll write uh, a thousand, two thousand words in the afternoon, and sometimes I will after supper. I'll edit, or I'll do my looking for legends video cast. Or I will do my live edit. I do a live edit on Thursday nights, generally on Facebook, where uh, you know, very stimulating for the, the viewers. I'm just sitting there. I'll read almost like a narrator, but then I'll stop and I'll edit the line or whatever, and they have to sit there and watch me. So most people don't stick around, but uh, a lot of people will come in and say hi and go back out again, and it's, it's kind of a fun way to do it. Hmm. And it makes a big difference, all these different ways to edit, too. Like I'll edit on paper. I'll edit on the screen. It looks different, and it... The edits are so much different. And then when you speak it out loud, like I, people told me that, and I'm thinking, I can't sit there in an empty room and just talk to a computer screen. I just, in my mind, I feel silly. But I can do that if I'm on Facebook Live, right. even though it's no different. Yeah. Although I, I think I'm actually speaking to somebody. But uh, especially the, the words between the quotation marks, when you read them out loud, are so much different. When, and, and you can edit them a lot better. At least I can when I'm reading it out loud. I'm thinking well, that's not how they would say that. <laughs> right? It looks neat in print, and if all, you know, I wrote this really powerful line. But uh, you think well, no one actually speaks that way. So right. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, it, this is not related to the previous question, but it, it reminded me. Um, I noticed you have your books uh, in audiobook. How did you manage to get that done? Yeah, I, I'm a member of a group called 20 Bucks to 50K. And if, uh, if you're an author and you want to learn the business side of it, that is a group to be in. It's, uh, it's on Facebook. It's called 20 Bucks to 50K. They take no BS. You, do, you advertise yourself once, you're kicked out, you'll never be back. It's, it's all about learning uh, the, the process of uh, the business, how to market your book. But uh, so they have these conferences in November in Vegas. Of all places so you're in a hotel in a like a we were in uh, sam's town for the first couple of years and when i was there i think there was 800 authors for a week 
and you learn so much in the panels, but you learn so much more at TGI Fridays or whatever when you're sitting down for supper and you're talking to all these different authors you've never met before. And uh, you start picking up tips from them. And, you know, what works for David Payne probably isn't going to work for me, but I can try it and I can mold it and make it work for me or just say, well, okay, that's not for me. It's and, and throw it away. But you get all these ideas and you can start experimenting with them and some of them will stick. So uh, going to the 20 bucks to 50 K conference, uh, this, uh, it's at Bally's now. I think they're changing. It's called the horseshoe tavern. It's right on the strip now. It's starting to get more expensive. It used to be very cheap. And, uh, but I think they're aiming for 2000 authors this year in November. And wow. If you're an author and you've never done that before and you have the means to get down there, do it. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, I probably won't go back for a little while just because it is kind of pricey. I live in Canada, so I got to fly and everything else. But and I'm not even sure what their question was at the beginning here, but <laughs> I just went off <laughs> to the tangent about just 20 bucks to 50K. It, it's an amazing group, but uh, like I say, it, it's a no BS group. They, they're only there about building you as an author and they have so much information and they, they have indie authors there that make like six, seven figures a year. Mm -hmm. So that's not me. Well, so the question was about uh, how do you get yourself set up for audiobooks? Oh, right. Audiobooks. Yeah. I, I went down a rabbit hole there and <laughs> didn't come back out. So audiobooks, uh, because I was at the 20 books to 50 K, uh, they had a, a, a panel on audiobooks. That's why I got stuck there. And uh, so I, when I came home, uh, in November of 2019, I guess it was the second year I was there. I'm saying, oh, I'm going to try audiobooks. And they, what I got out of those things was you just send your uh, information to these places like a find away voices and that, and they'll just give you a narrator and away you go. And of course that wasn't the way. And, uh, and you know, unless your books are really selling and stuff like that, they really won't even look at you. But uh, I saw through audible, which is Amazon, you know, lover hate Amazon. They are where it's at. You know, if you want to make money, it's going to be on Amazon, mm -hmm. and uh, so you, know, you just got to get over that fact if you don't like Amazon. But uh, they have an Audible, and uh, you can. There's a program called Royalty Share, and my mindset is that uh, it's just another revenue stream, and hold a bit small. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Royalty Share is uh, you're locked in for seven years with your narrator. You don't have to pay them, and they don't pay you. Uh, you just you give him the book or her the book, he'll narrate it and uh, they'll send it back and you edit it together and then they put it up on Audible and you split the royalties for the next seven years and then all the rights revert back to you. But I'm just thinking, you know, it's a revenue stream that I didn't have before and a revenue stream that I won't be able to get, one I can't afford. So I can either royalty share or not have Audible books at all right. or audio books at all. So I'm thinking, why not? And the problem with it, a lot of times these narrators, you know, they're cutting their teeth, so they're not they're not a James Earl Jones. Uh, you're not going to get that quality per se right out the hop because they're learning their craft as well. But it's just a way to get your books out there. I uh, I did spend uh, money on my last book, Keeper of the Jewel. I actually paid the narrator, and uh, they they're looking at two hundred fifty dollars per finished hour. Keeper of the Jewel is nineteen or nineteen hours long. Mm -hmm you do the math and uh, because people don't go on audible looking for Richard E. Stevens, they don't have no idea who I am. I don't sell a lot of audiobooks, So right. the chance of me ever recouping that money are probably split. And so uh, I, I don't know that I don't want to give anyone advice on that. Uh, I think that's something that you need to learn for yourself. But if you want to do audible or audiobooks, uh, audible certainly gives you a, a nice vehicle to do it. It doesn't cost you anything. You can do royalty share and you can have your books. It's just kind of a, again, I'm a, a little lone author and would I ever get my books on audio if I didn't do it this way? Probably not. So that's, so allow me to do that. All right. So talking about other revenue streams, I noticed you pop up a lot at local fairs. Yes. Uh, how, how do those work out for you? That's where I make my most money. So I, like, you know, I spend boatloads of money on Amazon ads and at the end of the month, I'm hoping that I will make a bit more than I spend. And was, there are many months that I don't. Uh, I, I think the end goal as a unknown author is to get your books into as many people's hands as you can. And hopefully word of mouth uh, down the road will start building your brand. And if, if people, like when we're doing a show like this, 
uh, your guests have no idea who's Richard H. Stevens. And well, I know um, who you are. I've you do, you but we, we've had we've had dealings before. But uh, you know, it, 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 when you do uh, interviews like this, uh, people don't know who I am, and that's fine. I don't expect them to. But if I do another interview and they see me again, and they're oh, well, there's that guy again. And you know, after about seven or eight times, and who the heck is this Richard A. Stevens schmuck? And then they might even actually look into my stuff and see if I'm any good or not, and, and whether I'm an author for them or not. But uh, these book fairs, I, they're they're fun because you actually get to talk face to face with potential readers. And and I've, I've found that the biggest key, if if you're an author doing these book fairs, is to let people know that you were the author. Most people see you and they think you're a bookseller. They see pictures of dragons on my banners and they come on. They come in, oh, there's no J.K. Rowling there, there's no George R. R. Martin, and they move on. But at that point, I say, well, I'm, if you're looking for anyone else, you're not going to find them. I'm the author. And as soon as I say that, all of a sudden, most of them are interested. You just look at the other person and go, those keep on going. But they're interested because now they're actually speaking to the author because most of them just think you're a bookseller. I've had, I put up signs, I went to Vistaprint, I got this great big sign saying, meet the author. I've got <laughs> pictures of me saying, you know, I'm the author. And even though these are your, these are readers that you're trying to attract, they don't read your signs, which is kind of ironic. Like, so when I tell them I'm the author, they go, oh, really? They're quite surprised. So, uh, but when you do that, a lot of people want to buy your book because they're actually meeting the author, they're getting the book signed. And uh, it's, a, it's a novelty to to have that done, you know, actually speak to the author. And uh, I think I've got a lot of fans that way, just carrying on a conversation with them. And uh, to me, uh, I, I guess before I became an author, and I don't think it's a big deal now, but if I would have met Terry Brooks, I still probably would be uh, fangirling all over him. But, uh, you know, I, I've had a couple of people say, oh my God, you're an author. And they get all gushy. And I mean, it, it's not a big deal. Like, I don't think I'm... <laughs> I think I'm anything special, but, but I see it from their point of view. And I, so when people meet you at these events and they realize that you're the author, the, the, the mind frame switches and they're actually interested in what you write and they might take a chance on you. I've had people come and say, eh, I'm not going to, I probably won't see you again. I'll buy all your books. Like, they might not like my stuff. I might not be the author that they like, but uh, they walk away with 14 books. I'm happy. <laughs> That's <laughs> the way to go. go. Yeah, yeah. So, so I really enjoy doing the book events. I did about 23 of them last year. We, uh, we how started, far do you travel for those? Like, uh, We've just been doing Ontario. Uh, I, I've traveled five, six, actually I've traveled nine hours, but still in Ontario. Ontario is pretty big. But, uh, you know, you got to factor in costs. So, you know, you have to pay for the books. Like, I have to pay to print the books. I have to pay for my gas. I have to pay for my food. I have to pay for my accommodations. I got to sell a lot of books in order to make money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my end goal is to get books in people's hands, but still I need to not lose money. Right. I, I need to make a bit more than I spend just to make it lucrative so I can keep doing it. Uh, just before COVID in 2019, we talked to people in the IRS, figuring out how we could cross border, how much uh, stuff we could bring in, what forms we needed to do. I wanted to come down to the States and because you know, in Canada, we do a Comic-Con and other than the Fan Expo in Toronto, you might get 5,000 people there. Mm -hmm. You do something in the U.S., you get 50,000 or more. Like Fan Expo in Toronto, I got 125,000 one day, which is really cool. But generally, the events in Canada are very small as opposed to the States. Like in the States, they do everything big. So we want to come down to the States, but we have to figure out the IRS portion of it. And then the state laws and everything else, it's, it's very uh, restrictive for a Canadian author to come into the U.S. So uh, we were going to do it in 2020. Of course, that didn't happen because of COVID. And uh, so we used 2022 as a, a year in Ontario to learn what events work for me and what events don't. Hmm. So maybe next year we'll sneak into uh, the US, but we have no plans doing it this year. Sneaking in, that sounds... Suspicious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that way I don't have to claim my stuff at the IRS. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. But uh, there's uh, if I sell... I think the, the limit, at, there was 2500 If I bring $2,500 worth of goods, I need a certain form. If I bring in more than $2,500 worth of goods, I need a different form, and it's more involved. So. Well, the key yeah. there is to say, well, I'm only bringing in one penny books. I'm just yeah, selling yeah. them for $25. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think they'll catch on. I, I, I don't want to uh, get myself banned for coming in again. So yeah. if I come in, I'll do it right. But uh, it's, it's just very daunting. I, I'd love to do it. And because we live in Canada, like it's so cold up here in the winter, we actually uh, fancy coming down and doing a tour of the southern states through the winter months. I've got a big dragon trailer. I've got a great big 14-foot trailer with my covers on the back, on the side. So <laughs> when you see a dragon driving down the 401 or the main highways in Canada, it's me. But I'd love to drag that thing. I'd love to drag my dragon down to uh, the U.S. Uh, southern states during the winter and enjoy the warm weather they have down there. But we're not there yet. Must be fun just to record a video of your trailer going by. <laughs> yes, uh, it, 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 it's really cool because people see it in different places. And also, oh, I remember him, and they'll stop. So I, I'm starting to get recognized, uh, not as fast as I would like, but uh, you know, I, I branded myself as an author, so people recognize the Soul Forge. Mm -hmm. uh, logo and everything else, and then they see the trail. Oh, I remember him in that. So it, sometimes it works to bring people in. Well, I have to admit, I'm a little jealous. You know that you know, you're 14 books in now. You uh, have you said 35 total that you've got kind of planned out. I've uh, probably got another 25 in my head. Yeah. So yeah. it seems like every time I write a book now, I get two more in my head. So I don't know if I'll ever stop. <laughs> and the nice thing about me is I've got the last book written. So Into the Madness is the last book that I, in my universe. And people ask me if I'll write beyond that. And I don't know, if I live long enough and get all these other books written, perhaps I will, just to, to write a story again about my original characters. But uh, realistically, I probably won't. Mm. I'm just jealous because most of my stories are just like, this is the story, that's it, nothing more. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we're all there. So you got to start somewhere. And, oh, yeah. uh, Definitely. But you got lots of time. Like uh, It took me until I was 52 to do it, so you've done it before me, so congratulations. If, you, if you're talking about Futures Lens, that, that's a very small project. <laughs> yeah. That's just I, one I, small I, story. But I, I didn't have I a book written. Like, I didn't have a book published until, well, I published my two novellas at the end of 2017, but I really didn't have a book published until Soul Force came out in August of 2018. I've done everything else since. So, you know, there's a time in life that uh, you, you actually hopefully be able to realize that you have more time to do it. And, uh, you know, for me, it took that long. And, some people the sooner I take my hat off and I I'm like this to anyone who can actually raise a family work a full-time job and publish books I like I'm not worthy that's amazing when people do that I think that good on you because I I couldn't do it well, that's fair all right I did want to ask you some questions about lurking for legends if you don't mind um no, not so at all. I, I asked this question of Christy and she basically said oh, well talk to Richard about it <laughs> Uh, and basically, how did you get started with Lurking for Legends? What was the goal behind uh, it? Yeah, but it's a long story. And it all started with, uh, there's an author in Seattle. His name is Rus Russell Trimble. And he has, um, I don't know if he has threats, but he, he, he has speaking issues. And uh, he's it doesn't, never stopped him. And uh, he stutters and stuff like that. And uh, it, but it's never stopped him. And he, he'd sit there and he'd read his books online on Facebook. And he'd read other authors, and he, he found me somehow, and he asked if he could read my books. And I said, sure. And I was so touched by that. And, you know, I'm very introverted. I'm not outgoing at all. And I said, God, I couldn't do that. I remember doing my first interview. I actually canceled on the guy and said, I can't do it, because I had to speak for three nights after I booked the interview. I said, oh, God, I can't appear on him. And then, you know, six months later, I figured if I have to, up, I want to up my author career, i got to do these things. So I've gotten over myself now. I, I can do interviews. I'm still introverted. But and anyway, uh, Russell, Russ... I call him Rusty. He did these line reads. So I figured, oh, I'm going to start doing that live edit. So I would I'd bring David Payne in and I'd read a bit of your book. And then I would live edit my stuff. And then I'm thinking, hmm, I could take this another step further and actually maybe interview authors because I was starting to get comfortable being online. And it's a lot different being online. I've, I've been asked to speak in front of audiences and that's not happening. But uh, <laughs> you know, online, I'm in front of my computer, so I feel a little safer. But uh, so I figured, well, maybe I could do this. And then um, I didn't know anyone to do it with because I, I was terrified to do it by myself. Because uh, what if I didn't have a question for the interviewee? Uh, I'd be staring at the screen. I'd be pretty dead interview. And uh, so I reached out to David Kelly, who was a science fiction author in Canada, and he couldn't do it. And then uh, when I was doing these live reads on Facebook, my live edits, uh, this one lady came in and she started listening. And I didn't know who she was. And she'd be the, every Thursday she watched and she made comments. It was Christy Stratos. And 
all of a sudden it dawned on me, Christy would probably be pretty decent. So I asked her if she'd do it. And I found that after I asked her this, she actually does stuff with a, another indie author called Joe Compton. Or so she knew how to do all these things. And so she was a great co-host. And she actually, I guess her to do the, the, the beginning because she does it so smooth. Uh, you know, I hum and haw and everything else. I don't do it as smooth as she does. So she was an awesome find. And Chrissy and I started doing that, uh, looking for legends, uh, beginning of 2021, 20, I guess. And uh, we just celebrated our 100th episode uh, last month. Or this month, I guess, was February 7th. Yeah, we're still Yeah, 100th episode. So it, it was my way of giving back to the author community uh, because uh, – if you're, especially if you're an independent author, uh, the author community is so great. They're so helpful. They're so willing to help you. It's not a competition as an author. It, it's not like you're selling a loaf of bread or a case of pop or something. It, you know, it, it, you write a book once a year or however long it takes to write the book. So it, I just find the author community so helpful that I wanted, it was my way to give back to the author community by bringing David Payne in. And like I say, I, I truly believe that, you know, you see my name here today and you see me today and yeah, so what who is that guy i don't know who he is but if you see me seven or eight times you know, who is this guy like, <laughs> you know, it might make you actually look into me a bit further and that's the whole adver- that's the whole reason behind advertising you see the same commercial on tv over and over and over again you have no idea what they're advertising because you don't care but all of a sudden you get this jingle in your head mm-hmm. and you can't get it out of your head and where'd it come from it's because you've been listening to this and next thing you know you're buying the product but uh, and so. next time you can load up your your trailer with loaves of bread that are branded with the dragon and you're good. Yeah. Well, we've we made a joke out of uh, making it into a French fry wagon as well. So, you know, <laughs> here, buy, buy a, buy a French fry, a, a large order of French fries for $20 and get a free book. <laughs> well, Cheap I, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I know that you have been doing all kinds of interviews and live reads with people on lurking for legends. And yep. uh, with the hundredth episode, you announced some changes. Uh, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to talk about what those changes are and how, how the series is going to, to move forward. Okay, yeah, after the first year, uh, into our second year, we're sort of 50, 60 episodes in, we decided that we want to bring authors in um, and actually read from their books. And it almost turns into, if I'm dating myself here, so sorry if your viewers are a bit younger, but it almost turns into a yeah. curve on that episode. So, okay. <laughs> So you know who Carol Burnett is, you got Harvey Corbin and Tim Conway and everything else. So they do the stand-up comedy and then they're, they're acting out a play or it's almost like a scene from a play, but they try and trip each other up and try and make each other laugh and get out of character. But uh, so we bring, we invite authors in to read excerpts from their books and it just gives them a little bit of, uh, you know, people get to see them that never seen them before. So people that uh, tuned into Lurking for Legends, they don't know who David Payne is, now they get to see him once and they get to hear a bit about his book and uh and you know if they like it maybe they'll buy it and but uh we we have great fun doing these things and we dress up and uh we put sound effects in and accents and everything else and we have a lot of fun and we find we get the most viewership interaction when we do our live reads so after a hundredth episode we decided that uh we're not going to go weekly anymore we're going to go uh the second tuesday of every month other than march 7th and that's only because David has an issue for March 14th. But uh, the second Tuesday of every month going forward, we invite authors to read with us excerpts from their books. So we all just a rule. And uh, so if we're reading from David Payne's book, uh, I would be one of the characters. Dave's probably going to be a narrator. And uh, we just get into it. And if he, uh, I remember David Kelly, uh, he was supposed to play a rhinoceros. So he found this rhinoceros mask and all of a sudden you're looking at your uh, your screen and you've got a rhinoceros looking back at them. It really threw the other readers out because they, they didn't expect to see, especially if you know David, you wouldn't expect him to wear a rhinoceros mask. But it's, we have a lot of fun with it and it's, it's a nice way to get uh, notoriety to uh, some authors that you know generally get the same media time as uh, George R. R. Martin might. Yeah, and and for piece of, speaking from personal experience, I had a great time being on there. So, uh, you know, thanks thanks again for having me on there. That was great. No, actually, if there are any authors in here that are listening, uh, if you ever want to read excerpts from your books, you don't even have to be published. We'd love to have you uh, just uh, reach out to me, uh, Richard A. Stevens, uh, dot com, Richard A. Stevens one at gmail.com. Just email me and uh, 
uh, we'll set it up. Uh, let me say we're doing it about once a month. Uh, sometimes we'll have two guest authors. Sometimes we'll have one. But we'll read about a 2,000 to 3,000 word uh, excerpt from your, one of your stories and have a lot of fun with it and give you a little bit of a uh, promo as well. Yeah, excellent. All right, I have a question from the kids who are asleep. It's uh, on another subject here. But uh, what random things have you found yourself researching while you're writing or editing? If you're researching. Uh <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I, even though I write fantasy, uh, some things still have to be plausible. Like uh, that's one thing I didn't like about the Hobbit, the movie. Like they took the signing book and made it into three movies that are three hours long, which is totally ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> you see, it, it, when they had the the big fight scene in the in the mine, I think it was in the first Hobbit uh, movie. Uh, you see a, a dwarf fall 40, 50 feet from one ledge to another, land on his back on these rails. And he just bounces back up and starts fighting again. Like it, it's not a Marvel movie. It's a there should be some realism in it, even though it's fantasy. So if a person falls forty feet, they're probably going to die. If they don't die, they're not going to be up fighting again. So right. the, you know, some things have to be uh, realistic. It's just to make it. Uh, it there can be some tenseness too. Like if, if a dwarf can fall forty feet, and there's really no tenseness in the scene because you figure he's he's like Superman. You can't kill him. So uh, I had to figure out uh, the tides in this lake. So I had this great big lake in one of my uh, original books, and there's a serpent that lives in this in this cave. And the serpent goes out in the lake and swims around during the day, but there are times that he cannot get back in his cave. And that's the only time you can go in to that cave because there's something in that cave you want to get. So you wait for the tide to go out. So he's stuck in the lake. You go in, grab what you need out of his cave, and hopefully it's a long cave. Hopefully you can get back out before the tide comes up and he comes back in again. And so, But I had to research to see if in big lakes are there actually tides that are big enough to you know, raise the water at least significantly enough to get it over this lip that would fill up this cave. I know there are tides in the ocean, and sure enough, there are tides in big lakes as well. So just so many things like that that you find yourself uh, researching. But... I think it adds credibility to the story. Like if if there were no tides on the big lake and people knew that, they go, well, what's he talking about? So That's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess kind of uh, in conjunction to that, how do you handle literary criticism? You know, someone goes over and says, hey, this is realistic. What are you doing here? What do you do about it? Yeah, it, it's tough. Uh, I know sometimes... Uh, I've got uh, different beta readers and some beta readers don't read fantasy and uh, they will question me on certain things. And uh, I think what that does is it helps you, it makes you pause and think about it and go over it and say, is what they're saying, does it actually really make sense? Because as the author, you just might have in your mind, this is the way it is. And when you take it to step back and look at it and you listen to other people, if I've got a few beta readers that are saying the same thing, then there must be something to it. And, uh, you know, that criticism, I'm thinking, oh, maybe they're right. But, you know, I've had, I had one, uh, one beta reader who doesn't read fantasy at all, but he reads my stuff. He said, I read the word portcullis and it just pulled me right out of the story. He said, change it. But that's and so I, and I had to think about it. And it, it's a cool word for a fantasy story. If you, anyone who reads fantasy knows castles, you know what a portcullis is. So, at that point, I figured, okay, well, he doesn't read fantasy. Yes, I can see it pulling mother stories. I don't know what that's, that word means. But most fantasy readers know things about castles and stuff and know exactly what a port call is. So I left it in. But uh, there are times when people call me out on stuff. And and oh, one person said, you say rock all the time. It's granite this, rock that, granite, because we're in these caves. And there's you know, I'm trying to let the reader know that they're in the rocks. And I realized that you know he was right. That's I'm just boring with death. They know that it's rock and they know that it's granite. I don't have to keep saying that. And, and my editor's beating that out of me too. I, I, I introduced this half giant named Pollard in my original series. And because it took me 35 years to write that first book, every time I came across Pollard, I wanted to keep emphasizing that he's strong and he's big and he's massive and every muscles and everything else. And every scene he was in, I kept saying that. And but you know, it was over years that I said this. I didn't want the reader to forget. And my editor she said you know your reader is give them credit they're smarter than you are you only have to say all or does that have giant and he's strong and you, once you never have to say it again they will always remember because they're reading that book in a day in a week whereas you know it's taking you months to years to write the book so even though it 
it's kind of lost in your memory over the years. The reader, it's right in their memory, and the reader's smarter than you. They'll pick things out that you'll never think of. Are we sure that the re the readers are smarter than us? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I uh, one of my beta readers, thank goodness, he was there. Uh, Into the Madness, the third book in the Soulford Saga. I spent a third of the book in one of the story arcs. So these two of the characters are trying to find this one thing, and they they come across, they find this gem. So I spend a third of the book finding this gem, and then I never mention the gem again. Like the gem is significant to the story, but I never mentioned it again. And so at the end of the book, uh, he, one of his feedback was, uh, whatever happened to that gem that your security are looking for so hard? Like, like <laughs> people die looking for this thing. What happened to it? And, oh my God, I forgot that. I knew we were supposed to go in, but I never actually, it goes into the, the tang of uh, the hero's sword and the gem interacts with the sword near the end uh, to deal with the dragon. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm glad he caught that because I did not. So I had to go back in and a couple chapters before the climax, I had to actually have a scene or this gem, I don't want to bore you with it, but the, it goes through a process and gets embedded in the tang of a sword. So when he faces the dragon, he's ready. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, we're here. All right. So last question, not really related yeah. to writing. Uh, outside of writing, what's your favorite hobby? My favorite hobby now probably is just I have a pool, so we like swimming in the summer. Uh, we like going for walks. We kayak. Just getting outdoors and uh, getting away from the screens. It's like right now I've got three screens staring at me. I've got my laptop that I'm doing this interview on. I've got my two desktop screens right behind me. Uh, I've always got an iPad in my face. Uh, I've got, I'm not a big phone person. My kids have to phone my wife to get a hold of me because I never I never know where my phone is. But uh, I'm generally always have my phone or my eyes on the screen. So I like to get away from the screen and just go outside. And even if it's just a walk around the neighborhood, uh, that's what I enjoy doing now. When I was younger, I used to do a lot more sports, but uh, you know, age has crept up on me and injuries start uh, taking a toll. So I don't do as much as I like to anymore that way. But, uh, and before COVID, we started to travel. Uh, I have a, a 2,500 book library in my house and I actually built a secret room during COVID. So, and again, this by getting older, uh, I wanted to take one of the smaller bookshelves at the bottom and have it open. And you have to crawl into the secret room. And that's where I keep all my original manuscripts. And my wife looked at me, she says, don't be stupid. She says, you're too old. You get down there, you never get back up. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, she has a point. When my back goes out, I can't get down there. So uh, I've, I've got this movable bookshelf that uh, it's, it's on little casters. And unless you really look for them, you can't see them. And uh, so you walk through my library, you have no idea it's there, and then I'll pull aside this movable bookshelf. And I've got this dragon head mounted on a wall like you'd see a, a buck when people do deer hunting. And it actually has got an aspirator in it and a breeze smoke. And it's really cool when people walk <laughs> in that room. So doing stuff like that is what keeps me busy now when I'm not writing. Well, excellent. Well, I want to thank you for being here. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I just threw up the links to your website and where to find your books i'll do that again so people can get those uh so we've got you linked on your website richardhstevens.com we've got you uh on twitter uh any any place else i can uh point people to uh, amazon uh, i'm on i'm in ku program so uh, that means i'm exclusive to amazon i i went wide for a little bit uh, a couple of years ago and again uh, trying to figure out the advertising to Google Play and Apple and all the other stuff. I just, you know, I made more money uh, through Kindle Unlimited, which is the page read, page read program through uh, Amazon. So I've gone back into being exclusive with Amazon. Again, whether you like Amazon or not as an author, that's where it's at. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm exclusive with Amazon. If you want to find my books there on Amazon, and if anyone ever wants signed copies of my books, you just have to email me at uh, uh, Richard H. Stevens 1. I don't know who has Richard H. Stevens. It might be me from a long time ago with a different, but I couldn't get it. So it's Richard H. Stevens one at gmail.com. And I'd be happy to uh, mail you a signed copy or two. And uh, if people buy my books more frequently, then I start including bling and signed pictures. Now that you see these pictures behind me here, those are all interior pictures that appear in my books. So uh, I sign them. I'm not the artist for most of them. I do a few of my own, but uh, I will sign them and I send them memorabilia out as well. So I'm saying thank you. And I also invite my readers to name dragons in my books. So if you're, if you're a return reader and you want to name a dragon and have your name mentioned in the front of the book, 
saying thank you to David Payne for naming the dragon Grimclaw. Then you get to follow your dragon around in my stories, and uh, your name actually gets mentioned in front of the book. So if you have a dragon name and you want to give it to me, and when I come across the next dragon that I don't know the name for, I go through my reader suggestions and my users. I will email you and ask you if I can include your first, your real name in the front of the book. So it's kind of a nice way to get back to my readers as well. Yeah, sounds good. You just need to include Jerry the dragon in there now. Jerry's kind of Jerry. the mascot here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny because I, when I do these book shows, I, I've got this little sign-up sheet that people can actually put names down for me, and then you know I want them to check off, be on my. Uh, my newsletter list they don't have to if they don't want to but that's you know i'm trying to get newsletter subscription but uh they give me dragon names and some people give me names like smog or some of the game of thrones dragons and i, I tell them you know, i can't really use those names because george r. r martin he has a bit more money than me and if we go to court he's probably gonna win so yeah. you know, it's, it's got to be original it can't be a name that's already been taken as cool as those dragon names are i can't use them so well, Richard, it has been a pleasure speaking with you tonight. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, my apologies again for uh, taking so long to get you on, but I'm glad. Oh, no worries. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate uh, being on here with you and your guests and uh, or your viewers. And uh, hi to everybody. And thank you for listening. All right. Uh, so hang tight for one second. Uh, and you out there in Twitch land, you also hang tight. Just give me one moment. Bye-bye. <laughs>